All right, we are Libertarians. How y'all doing today? We are uh, probably bad. I guess you're probably bad. Everybody else here is probably bad. I don't think anybody's doing better during this time, but it's, uh, it's the COVID-19 coronavirus. Uh, I have Andrew Bowman here. Andrew, how are you today? Wonderful, Hody. How are you doing? Doing great. You might hear Andrew Bowman calling some basketball games at your local uh, radio program. Yeah, never again. Never again. <laughs> You did a good job. It was fun, but uh, it, it was kind of cool. I was like, oh, I know somebody famous now. I wouldn't say famous, but ever since I was on the radio, the world has taken a turn for the worse. Uh, so I'm blaming that partially on me. Oh, uh, okay. Well, boom, boom went your dynamite. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> here we also have uh, Ryan Lindsay. Of course, you know him. Uh, editor, owner, and operator of The Heretic, the rebrand of The Wall Reader. Uh, which you can find just about everywhere. Got blogs pretty much every day now, up, updating you on the virus, and then uh, and, and then some. And then he's still working on the next quarterly publication. Ryan, how you doing? Uh, not too bad. Just uh, tired, but other than that, pretty good for being what one week into quarantine, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and then we got Ryan Hold. You know him. Come on. This is the Robin to the Batman that is Chris Spangle. This is the guy who runs Ryan Hold. You've read his blogs for years. You've probably heard him called everything from a Nazi to a communist just because his views are as intense as his love of liberty. Ryan Hold, how you doing today, buddy? I'm doing well. I just don't think I can live up to all that, but uh, I will do well, my best. I'm sure somebody will call you a communist and or a Nazi after this. No worries. <laughs> uh, guys, obviously things are, things are rough, uh, but today I wanted to talk about some of the heroism that we've seen. I feel like it's a good time for it because I think we'll look back and see a lot of the people who did the right things, but that's kind of like a hindsight being 2020 and we want to try to look at some of the, and, and we're not talking about good news about the virus. There's, there's no good news. Even if it only killed one person, it's still bad news, right? But we want to talk about the people who acted heroically, even though they were facing, you know, a virus and something really dangerous and deadly. So uh, yeah, just, uh, just happy to update you on some of that. Now with that very open-ending thing, I have a list of all these great and good news things, but uh, do you guys have something that pops into your mind personally in your maybe immediate area or your circle or even just something you've heard about or something in your town that has been that would qualify as some heroism or some goodness God. well i can i can shout out uh, andrew bowman i believe he is hosting a blood drive after finding out that there were this desperate need for blood so are you that's for a real andrew there we go hey my, my camera is flashing at me, so I might have to change the battery in a second. But yeah, uh, so because of what Chris's um, other day job is with his Now Hear This uh, radio show, you know, he had the uh, Indiana CEO of the American Red Cross on speaking about the need for blood drives. And so that got me thinking of how we could use our connections here in our area. So. Uh, you know, I live in Indiana as well, just like seems like half the folks on the wall uh, network. Um, I'm over Indiana, Illinois border. And um, so I'm in the Rotary Club here. I sent a quick text message to the club and asked if it was okay. And uh, they're like, yeah, go for it. See what you can find out. I sent an email to the Red Cross and four minutes later, I had a reply back and about an hour later, I was on the phone with them. In less than 24 hours, we have a date location secured and um, radio stations are getting ready to start promoting it. And we have a huge network within our Rotary Club of people who are going to um, promote the blood drive. And so we're really excited about that just because the how easy it was, right? Like it was almost no effort. It was an email. It wasn't even an email. It was a fill out a form, a questionnaire on their website. They emailed me, called me, and then we had it to go set up, like I said, in less than 24 hours. Now, yeah, it's still, I guess it's four weeks away. Um, but from what the interview that Chris did, they said that, um, you know, in Indiana, 150 blood drives 
have been canceled in the last week. And across the nation, he said 4,000 blood drives have been canceled in total. So there's definitely a need for it. And it was surprisingly easy to set up. And uh, according to my contact with the Red Cross, uh, the Rotary Club, we really don't even have to do a whole lot during the, the blood drive. They're like, yeah, you pretty much did all the work you had to do. So it's all in their hands now. They just need organizations to step up to say, hey, we've got a location and, and we can spread the word and, and get folks to it. So um, I guess you can say <laughs> that that's uh, something that, that we're doing over here, but it all came because of what Chris had in his interview there uh, a couple days ago on Now Hear This. So. Yeah, I'm surprised how many people were enlightened by that. The I, I and I I had no idea that blood was necessary either. You always hear about them having too much, having too much, having too much, but then a crisis like this happens and you hear nothing but not enough, not enough, not enough. Uh Rotary Rotary's a great group if you're just, for any reason. I mean, it they they're doing great stuff all the time, but it's it's really cool that they uh that, that you're there. I know you're helping out a lot there. You have some seniority in the Rotary Club, yeah. I, I wouldn't even say seniority. I joined a year ago and now I'm already the president elect elect. So I won't take over this coming year. It'll be in 2021 20, is when I'll be president of Rotary. Okay. Um, but it's, it's fun. So <laughs> <laughs> I like that you're referring to it as the takeover already. We're all excited for the Andrew Bowman takeover. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I've infiltrated it. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, you know, honestly, if you work for any organization that's volunteer based and you show up like more than twice, people start being like, okay, well, you're yeah. pretty much the leader of this thing. Let's slap yeah. some medals on them. It's uh, yeah. Uh, hard to find volunteers. Um, but if you are in a category of people who can volunteer, um, I've known, I, I guess, a couple of nurses that I have that are friends that are just going full time during this thing, even when they don't have to be there, they're, they're helping out. And of course they're salaried. So they don't, they don't get any extra for being there on days off, but they know they're needed. And it's, uh, one of them's in the Seattle area, which is of course getting hit harder than pretty much anywhere else. Um, uh, so Andrew, uh, uh, a, a cape goes to you, my good friend. Uh, anybody else with any cool stories? Uh, a pretty cool story. Um, this actually just happened last night in uh, Springfield, Missouri, where I live. Um, but the weather here the past few days has been pretty awful, uh, just cold and rainy and all that. Um, but last night it actually got below freezing. Um, but all of the uh, municipal homeless shelters um, were shut down because of all the uh, new health code regulations about gatherings of 10 people and all that stuff. Um, and just fears of spreading the virus. And uh, so it was a pretty last minute thing, but within just about a day, um, we have a church in town called uh, the Connecting Grounds and they really focus on reaching out to the homeless population here, which we have quite a bit of because we're kind of the axis of three uh, pretty big highways. Um, and they really focus on them and they organized with, I think 11 or 13 different churches in the area. Um, and we were able to find spots for uh, over 100 homeless people um, to stay overnight in a warm shelter and uh, got um, volunteers for each location uh, to stay up overnight and all. And um, so, yeah, it was a really great uh, group effort on the part of all those churches. And uh, the city even tried to shut um, shut all of the several of the different locations down. Um, I stayed at one of them and uh, about 10 minutes after the all the homeless guys came in, the fire marshal walked in and was like, you have a permit to do be doing this? No. And I was like, no, we don't. <laughs> and, uh, and so, yeah, we didn't have a permit or anything. And so we got, um, luckily, we, I mean, lucky, we just got, uh, the church got like a uh, warning and nothing like serious came out of it. But, um, but yeah, it was just, and uh, well, and it was great because none of the churches, even in the face of that intimidation, like back down and we're like, okay, like you all have to leave, go find somewhere else. Um, right. So it was just really neat to watch that come together. Yeah, good, good. I guess I know what you mean by like, luckily, I think the gut, <laughs> gut, gut reaction is to kill the fire, fire marshal. But <laughs> I, I, it's probably uh, when he has the power absolutely to 
I mean, we, we've seen homeless drives before. It, it was even a sting operation. What was it, Kansas City, where they yeah. Uh, yeah, arrested whole groups at, you know, at once. They were feeding the homeless at four different locations and mm-hmm. did a sting operation and arrested all of them. And it was a terrible thing. Poured, uh, that was the same one where they poured bleach in their food too, right? Like, I uh, think so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, just – so we've, I guess at least they're not, what, setting the beds on fire would be an equivalent <laughs> on that, right? And just being right. like, well, here's what you're doing. But uh, yeah, just kind of goes to show some of the interference. Um, I know that uh, in LA right now, they're kind of doing the same thing with the, the homeless. This is a story I was looking at earlier today. And it's really sad. They, uh, over the last five years, they've had this project funded and it would, the bill was passed and everything, but they just never got around to building these, 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 these homeless shelters, right? They passed it, they had the money there, but they just never. And it's funny because when you're a stockbroker, and uh, the stock market tanks, they'll print off $1.5 trillion in a day to, to help you out. But of course, when you're homeless, they've had five years to try and get this thing done and they're barely even done. And a lot of volunteers have come forward to, to basically illegally try to finish this government project that they never, never finished up. And it, I mean, for me, I just think that is such a, I applaud them for going into that kind of danger because I know that how the government gets when you step on their toes but it, it has to happen. You know, I think the people that suffer the most during this crisis, I mean, I, I'm, I don't think it's fair. I'm not one of those people that hates all rich people. If you have to sell a house or whatever, that's awful. But people that don't have a house, I mean, to begin with, things were already rough. How many people are going to be driving in traffic and handing out dollar bills if that's how you get money? You know, you're in some trouble. And so that, that's good, man. That's good. Well, you guys being real life heroes here, I picked up groceries from my grandparents and I feel like I deserve a gold star. But yeah, you're awesome. Um, now, I, I think probably the best place to start when we talk about heroism and as far as the national news, news goes is um, uh, Helen Chu, that uh, Dr. Uh, Nick Sarwark talked about her when he went on MSNBC uh, in Seattle that uh, and I had to look this up because I was like, what was her deal? All I heard is she kind of broke the law to do this research. And she was already on a research project researching the flu, just in general, not coronavirus or COVID, just the flu. And she found that it, she was really able to repurpose the current test that she had to find out if somebody had the virus. The trouble is, is she needed approval from both the state and the federal officials within her organization to say yeah you're allowed to repurpose these tests and they said no they said no they said no and she finally just said i'm gonna do it anyway and repurposed them did it the tests and and unfortunately this kind of highlights where one of the reasons why we were too late on this is the very first person to test positive here in america was somebody who had not had a travel history meaning somebody had already, the, 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 the disease was here already. It, there was no preventing it. There was no watch out for people who have traveled or quarantining outside of our borders. It was already here. And at that point we had to deal with it, but we wouldn't have known in time if she didn't break the law. And when we see all these charts that says, you know, Hey, even if you can stop a couple, that's a long way in the long run. It's one of those things that says, yeah, maybe we would have found out about it in a couple of days, but a couple of the days in by the end of this thing could be the difference between, I mean, some people will argue about it, but between like a few hundred and a few thousand and, or maybe a few million lives. We don't exactly know at this point in time, but that, that's one of those things that I just find. Uh, I, I, I get scared about breaking the law. I hate to admit that as a libertarian. I am pretty much a rule follower unless the rule is really, really bad. And in this case, the rule was really, really bad. And I'm, I'm glad that she did it. Uh, my closest instance of any type of boogaloo is like feeding the homeless knowing that it's against the law. But I, as soon I'd be one of those guys that as soon as the law shows up, I'd be like, well, pack it in. They caught us guys. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to pull a gun on anybody. I'm just a wuss. I'm a libertarian wuss. I don't know. Maybe I'm the only libertarian wuss, but that's just, uh, I don't, I don't want to die. And I got to think there's a lot more people like me that are, that would be scared to do these right things. You know, if it was easy, then everybody would do it, as they say, you know, and, and I got to think there's a lot of people like me that just says, oh, just because I risk personal liberty, I don't want to I don't want to do that, even though these people maybe even desperately need it. You know, anyway, that's just my thoughts on on 
Helen Chu, do you guys have any thoughts on that? Cool. All right. Well, uh, there you Oh, you're okay. Um, Go ahead. <laughs> no, I just said, I think it's great that she did that. And um, I'm seeing, that's what I see going on now is all the doctors, the, the medical communities are basically stepping up and leading because the people who are supposed to be leading aren't right. So are not able to, or being told not to. Um, it's like you, you see Dr. Fauci up there, you know, given all this information and then you'll see Trump say something, you'll see him have to clarify it because, you know, Trump's truth and real truth are two different things usually. So uh, he's usually. at least making sure that the information is getting out there. Right. So that's something I learned about uh, Trump is just that from now on, if he says something, the exact opposite is usually what's true. So like if he told me that the, the it was raining outside, I'd have to go to the window and check just to make sure I'll be able to trust it. But um, beyond that, we still have, you know, we have people like Dr. Fauci who's out there and, um, doing doing the work and getting people informed and that's that's the real key is the more information we have the more knowledge we have is is how we're going to end up getting through this right yeah you know there there is some uh i'm going to talk with brian about it on monday uh same network if you're listening on we're libertarians you'll hear from brian then and we're gonna he's done a lot of research as far as some of these cures and this is something that trump and and fauci kind of had a little bit of a disagreement about the other day there are four clinical studies that show that the now it's it's a virus so you're it's not technically a cure but you can cure the symptoms that would kill you which is effectively i guess a cure yeah you're less you're lessening the symptoms right so right that's the 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 drugs that they're using right now that are showing promise are are um, anti parasite drugs or malaria drugs right so yeah. malaria is a parasite but the parasite attacks you a similar way that the this virus is touching you so these aren't antivirals they can't get rid of it but if they can limit the uh, the symptoms of the damage that's being done in the lungs uh, and let people still be able to breathe and get oxygen uh, then they can pass through and, and then successfully come out the other side on this so it's not going to cure it but it does it does make the uh the people who are really close to to dying in icu might have a chance to pull back and and recover right and this isn't to create too much promise here dr fauci was talking about it just today saying we kind of have to regulate it we want doctors prescriptions for it we really don't want to authorize it for this disease yet because I guess two grams of it is enough to kill you. So people that take it and want to make a sandwich out of it might kill themselves. Uh, yeah, it's yeah, it's it's not. Uh, there are some side effects that are potential with this mm-hmm. drug. Now, normal normal dosing that the, the doctors would do would be fine with it. But you've got people who are a little little crazy who may just go out and try and get them. And yeah, you know. I did I did note even. Right now, I looked, and there are places you can buy the drug. It's very illegal to do so, well, but they'll ship it to you. <laughs> it's it's already off label for certain things, right? So it's not like it was used for malaria and then nobody's using it. It's mm-hmm. actually used to to uh, fight arthritis as well. Yep. All right. So there's, there's other off label purposes for it. So there are people who have this drug and have been and it's been around. So there are stores of it. It's not a lot, and they're starting to run out already. Yeah. But the doctors are going against all that and and going ahead and using it for those critical patients and those people who really need it and they're seeing some success with it that's why this is a potential good thing we just uh we just need to know for sure uh, what's going to happen with that so we still need to do the trials we still need to do the testing but there's also people who are dying that if they don't get the drug, they're going to be dead so there's a lot less risk than giving it to them than it would be to someone who's kind of healthy but might have been pos- tested positive for it yeah, and as a, I mean, as a doc, you want to talk about people who have skin in the game. If you are a doctor or a pharmacist, whether they say it blatantly or not, if you prescribe something that they asked you not to or say that you maybe shouldn't, I mean, just ask anybody who's tried to prescribe opioids for pain, you know, and you look at this, you're looking at a loss of your license, you know, and, and that's your whole career. And I mean, I, for me, I just think that's awesome heroism, seeing people that are saying like, hey, this works. Yes, there's some personal accountability you need to have for it. And maybe even my, the doctors that are doing it would probably still be more comfortable meeting each of these patients, but they understand this isn't exactly a luxury that we have and, and they're, they're doing it anyway. Um, 
So one thing, uh, a couple of things that I noted, and I've just pulled these off of line when I, when I was searching today, off of line, <laughs> offline, I'm boomerang hard right now. Um, Self-organization list. We actually had one of these going on in the chat. I forget who was organizing it, but it was like an Excel sheet for a lot of the churches to coordinate. Um, it, they're calling it care mongering right now, but there's actually huge uh, groups. They're doing it by state in the United States, but they've done it in Canada, Britain, and Germany. Um, and they're talking about giving away food. They're offering um, f foster care for animals, um, picking up medications for people that can't get them. Um, there's actually a woman in the UK who designed a postcard that you can drop off with your neighbors who are self-isolating and they and offered to help shop with a friendly phone call. They, they, we've used her template here in the United States and I'm looking at it right now, but just saying like you put it on the door, hey, I'm gonna pick this card up tomorrow, but hey, check this box. If you need help picking up your mail, getting some groceries, you know, I, I can help you with that. And be surprised what a big difference it makes to people. I, I think for me, it is very heartbreaking to look at those pictures of like somebody who's 80, 90, 100 years old at the store and not finding the thing that they need. They shouldn't be out anyway, right? I mean, we, these are the people that are in the in the 15%, you know, or 14.3%, whatever it is, chance to die just by getting it. That's That might sound, oh, you know, it's only 14% chance. I mean, that's high. <laughs> that's still very high. You know, that that's a, basically if you roll a, a die, a six sided die, and it comes up as six, you're dead. And I don't, I mean, that's literally Russian roulette, I believe, right? One, you put one in, in the chamber in a six chamber, spin it, put, pull the trigger. And that's the odds that these people are looking at right now, just to put it in perspective, you know, just by being out, you know, if they get it and to know, to see them, struggle to find the things that they need and everybody's struggling to find things they need a little bit but especially them going place to place you just say oh my gosh if there's a way that they can stay inside they should stay inside <laughs> you know um so that's something good that i saw um feel free to pop in if you hear something that sounds familiar to this what was the thing that we did have going into the in the wall chat was that church organization what was that we had the excel sheet and somebody shared it and I was like, oh, that's really cool. I'm not going to participate, but it's cool. <laughs> I don't think I remember that. I might have been, I might have missed it. That's all right. Um, there that's are stores. Chat. <laughs> oh, it's all right. Oh, yeah. One of my other chats. <laughs> stores are designated certain hours for at risk shoppers, which I think is also cool. So, I mean, let's face it. It is easy to say, well, you should have been prepared for the apocalypse as libertarians. We're always prepared for the apocalypse. But, I mean, we live in a society. We know not everybody does. And it's becoming more apparent within my circles that even libertarians weren't fully prepared for, for, for even a two-week shutdown. And there's things that you look at. Like I said, even my food storage, it's cool and it's two years worth. But then there's certain things where you're like, man, I really wish I had... I never stocked it with salt. Like I, It's like plain rice and stuff like that. And I'm just like, oh. the there was a meme going out that uh, was really funny where they said day one of uh, self quarantine, I've got all the food I need for the next two months. I'm set. I've got this, that ready to go. And it was like at, at 9 AM or whatever that said one forty five PM day zero. Yeah. I went to the store and got some, uh, cause I wanted a Twix. Yeah. Right? <laughs> right. It's not pleasant living, even if you were ready, but I think it's nice that some of these stores are designating hours for at risk shoppers to be like, Hey, let's, you know, if, if you are in that situation where you are in that compromised immune system category and you really need something, we're going to take real careful precaution, make sure everybody's wearing gloves, masks, everything like that, and they go. Um, China's been hit, I believe, even still. Let me update. Yeah, they're still, oh, no, Italy passed them up. But they have, uh, they have been hit, I guess, the second hardest in the world by this. Now, this makes sense. They're ground zero. Well, yeah. there's some things with the China too. We we know that they're not reporting any new cases the last few days, and they're shutting down their special. So they built up these hospitals specifically for this virus, and then they're starting to sh shut them down now. Yeah, uh, so they don't have anybody going to them anymore. But we're also hearing that that's potentially all propaganda, and they're just not giving out numbers and they're hiding a lot of stuff. I don't know. I mean, it's hard to say one way or the other on that because we're having a little media war between China and the United States because uh, China, uh, I guess we kicked out some of their reporters. So they end up kicking out some of our reporters. So now 
there's no information sharing going on and we're rebuilding that big um, kind of informational wall that we used to have with China back before Nixon, right? So we're getting back to those days now. So that's going to be fun to watch. Oh, so we, okay. we really just don't know. We can't, we can't depend on, just like we're not getting any information out of Russia. According to Russia, they don't even have the virus. And I'm like, yeah, you do. And we know you do. And you're lying. That's, we expect that, right? So we know we're not getting good information from there. And, and really the, the problem is the information we're going to get, if we had good testing in place and we had to be able to find out exactly where this was at and what was going on with it and track the movement of it, it'd be a little, it'd be so nice to do that, but we just don't have that right now, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. There, there's some, and I did notice that. And unfortunately China would kind of be the, the we need their numbers the most because if it originates there, and there wasn't really the protections in place yet. It'd be nice to see, like, hey, is it getting better? Well, the thing worse? is, is that we like think it originated there, right? I mean, you know, yeah, it, it's it's. I mean, even in the CDC, they said they believe it originated right. in the yeah. Western area in the market. They do believe it, and it, well, and and, and, and uh, the the story about the wet market thing is apparently bogus. Oh, because even that's the last CDC thing I said even talked about the wet market. So yeah, you, they, I, I, they don't is... think that that's it. They don't think that. So that's um, it is a variant of a a known bat virus. It's a mutation from a bat virus, but it could have been transmitted in, in a number of different ways other than someone eating a bat in a, in a wet market, right? So it could have been just a soup. bite to a dog. The dog could have given it, you know, passed it on to to a human. It somehow mutated so that humans could get it. So that's mm-hmm. kind of what happened. So it's very possible this thing had been around for six months and we're just seeing it get to people who um can get to medical care and get it so we don't like i said i i really don't even know where it came from i mean i suspect it probably did come from china it's probably 90 percent believe that but i also know that we te- we technically just don't know yet yeah i saw there was some arrests um like they they arrest somebody who like worked at harvard over here for his role in hiding the like how it started and he worked in china and i don't obviously that's just an arrest that's not a conviction i don't i don't know the details of that but you know and he was one of those guys working at that you know i know the big the initial thing was they have it they and they this is true they do have a big uh disease research center there i think it's a who research center but uh, and he did work there. And so it's one of those where a lot of people right off the bat were like, oh, it leaked from that facility. And they're like, no, no. And at this point, there's so much finger pointing. Who can well, say? Just like uh, like the Spanish flu. Where do you think the Spanish flu came from? Uh, I, I learned this from you and I looked it up. Kansas, right? Well, the first known case was in France, I believe. Oh, was it? Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I heard uh, some... Yeah, it, it didn't come from Spain. Yeah, <laughs> so it wasn't even in Spain. That. Yeah, that was just what happened. Um, so, uh, in light of you actually talking about China kind of shutting these facilities down, there were some medical workers, they had 30 tons of equipment and they actually flew that and themselves to Italy. It's a group of, it looks like nine of them from China. And with what I understand about China, their government's probably not really happy about that, but they were like, Hey, if you're going to shut us down here, there's somewhere else that we need to be. And I, I, I mean, that's, that's crazy. They're doing so at their own expense. Um, they're various experts and there's pictures of them. I saw it on CGTN. Um, but yeah, that, that's, another, that's another really cool story there. And, and it's kind of what I was saying before. The doctors and the medical community are going to do what they need to do because that's, they, they have an oath. I mean, when they, you go into the medical profession, you're not going in there to get rich. You're going in there because you want to save lives, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and you want to protect people and get them healthy again. You want to make them experience life better. I mean, that's, that's their goal yeah. and uh, more than anything else. So when they're getting told, Hey, you can't help these people who are desperately needed, they're going to balk and they're going to do it anyway. So it's always good to see private communities and doctors and things like that. Just saying, we're going to do this. You guys figure it out on the back end, however you want to do it. And you can come along with us for the ride or you can just shut up and leave us alone, but we're going to go take care of people. Yeah it's it's i think you want to fall back to your oath and just say okay do no harm well you know if i do nothing nothing can go wrong but they know better that they could help people if they do something i think there's a there's an almost an inaction applied to the hippocratic oath you know but i think a lot of these doctors t- 
take it and just say, no, my job isn't to just do no harm. My job is also to help, you know, and that's, and that's what I'm going to do. Um, on a lighter note, you guys have probably seen some of the, uh, some of the fun ones where people like are leading like exercises outside of the, the apartments in like Spain or like, uh, when they're singing in Italy, just with the apartments where they're having like these communities where they just stand out on their balconies and start singing. I I'm looking forward to that. I think that would be fun here. Uh, I, I don't live in a balcony type area, but, uh, you know, if it's something that brings people together and provides some entertainment, I mean, why not? Uh, we talked so much about saving lives. Uh, Andrew, Ryan, I don't want to cut you guys out of it, but I'm sure you and about everybody have noticed a need for entertainment during these times. Like, I, I mean, it's kind of goofy to just say, oh, I left to go get a Twix, but part of the human experience is also entertainment, you know, is also being happy while you live, not just being a human battery. And I think that that's something, have you guys seen any of that or noticed anything in your personal lives where you say like, man, I really miss this fun thing to do, or, Hey, there's something I found that's fun to do. That's kind of come up because of this. Yeah, yeah. I know. Oh, sorry. You go ahead. Andrew. Go for it, Ryan. No, you go for it. Okay. Um, I know like at least in this area and, uh, probably in lots of others also, but, uh, lots of, uh, like local, um, bands and musicians who would normally be playing in like bars and restaurants and, um, stuff right now. Uh, they've started doing some really good like YouTube or Facebook live shows instead. Um, and just doing those for free for everybody. And, uh, I know that, um, at least me and my wife have got a lot of enjoyment out of a couple of those so far. So. You that had an article about that in the Heretic, if I'm not mistaken. What local musicians are doing, right? <laughs> I did, yeah. And that was actually a a, a guest submission. Um, uh, oh, yeah. A friend of mine who is um, a musician on the side wrote wrote that for it. That's awesome. All right, Andrew, you you were a gentleman. It is now your turn. <laughs> right, it's that Midwest hospitality. Um, you know, Megan and my wife and I, we were talking about how, you know, two weeks ago you could just leave the house and do whatever you wanted you know, go grab dinner, go to a movie or whatever. Um, so here in our community, there's not many places to go out to eat anyway. And now with everything kind of being closed down, I know Hody, you're definitely, you're part of that uh, camp, you know, um, the restaurant that's literally, I can see it from this window just down the road from us. Uh, they Friday, Saturday and Sunday carry out only. And so we, we ordered from them yesterday. It's just a small family owned little restaurant here. And they only have one phone line. So when I tried to call and place the order last night, it was busy. Uh, and I had to call about three or four times before I could actually get through. And when I finally got over there, picked up our food, they were just slammed with orders. It was really cool to see that kind of response from the community that they know, hey, these folks really need us to, to help out. And when I saw a picture on Facebook, it was like, um, you know, those restaurants in those um, places in town that you've always been hitting up for fundraisers. Now it's your turn to, to give back to them and, and really make sure we take care of our, our local, you know, restaurants and, and whatnot. But just in our community, all the locally owned family places are, are blowing up with work, um, with people responding to that call and and, you know, ordering out when they can, you know, especially during this time, you know, we talked about this, I think, in the group chat earlier, how we really need to make sure that we, we do that, and we, we take them up on their, their offer and their hard work, and uh, our neighbor right across the street, she's the manager of that restaurant, uh, and she's been overwhelmed with the, the support that the community has given during this time, and, um, you know, they're not used to doing and operating business as a carryout. You know, it is a nice, it's a steakhouse. And, and so for them to switch up their, their routine and now they have a, one of their servers is a delivery driver delivering the meals too. Like it's really cool to see they're able to adapt that way and the, the response that the community has given them to in their support. So, yeah, these, these drive stores are going to be available. You know, your local mom and pop should shops might shut down so if you have the money and you know that your stores are good for a certain amount of time yeah go go out to eat to a place that's be as long as they're being safe and smart I, you know um chris and i were going to schedule kind of 
the debate that we've been having, whether these places should stay open or not. And I, I don't want to reopen that here. Uh, it's something we, we, we plan on talking about in a week or so. Um, and, and I'll wait for that time. But it is, it is something that I think as a libertarian, when somebody says, hey, we're going to be safe, we're going to be smart, but we care about our employees too. And we're providing an outlet. You know, we've switched up to to-go's. The ramen house that I mentioned, that is hardly a to-go place. They're the ones staying open here against the law. And I think that's great. I have a cook friend who happens to work there, which is the only reason I even knew about this. And he was like, yeah, if I if they shut down, I would not be able to afford my bills. You know, I would be in a lot of trouble. I think if you know anybody in the restaurant industry, they are hurting right now, for sure on some level. I mean, I'm sure even the server that went delivery driver isn't making what he's used to making. And, and, you know, the cook's hours are shifted and everything is just kind of wonky a little bit, but yeah, it's, it's, it might seem like, I guess I, I asked about it in terms of entertainment and it might seem kind of luxurious, but for some people like your luxury is kind of their way of life. Nobody needs to go out to a buffet, you know, like, like I run, but but we kind of count on people going out to buffets, you know, and, and having that luxury. And so when you shut that down, that is kind of one of those things that you say, well, that was, that was my, that's my life. That's how I was paying the bills was by having people have like a more than a minimum amount of experience, you know? So in this kind of era where everybody's shut in and looking at minimums, um, Reinhold, I didn't want to pass up on you. Did you notice any, any entertainments or any quality of life things happening during the coronavirus? Um, well, I mean, I've seen the same things where people are doing things, uh, they would normally do traveling, like, um, a lot of comedians. So I, I follow comedians a lot. I've known, a, I've met a lot of them and I've uh, spent some time with them. I've even got one who's a real good friend of mine. So, um, I noticed the other day that Christopher Titus is putting his, all of his specials up on YouTube for free. So, and then he's got a little tag in front of it where he's talking about once this is over, what he's wanting to do is try to get as many comedians as he can to, commit to one show every week that they do is um, split the, the proceeds for that show is split between the, all the servers. So it's called like the server night. So they're trying to get that so they can get the people who do the work and serve at the shows, give them a little bit extra money or a little b a benefit from that to help kind of overcome what they're losing from this. So there's a lot of people thinking about how they could help and doing things like that. So just check it, just check it out. If you're, you know, Twitter and yeah. Facebook and everything else. They're, they're putting that information out there. So awesome. Yeah. In between cool. working and podcasting, my entertainment is video gaming. And there's been some awesome developers that have just said, you know what? Everything from saying like, let's go 75% off to some guys just saying, Hey, during this time, play for free. And I, I don't pretend that this is anything more than, than a type of marketing tactic. I understand you get people hooked on your game and then after things right. get okay, you hope they buy it. But at the same time, they didn't have to offer it for free at all, obviously. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's things they can do for marketing that wouldn't be this. I mean, they're doing this yep. for a side benefit of, okay, it was going to make us look good. But that's, you know, a lot of people do things like that. But it's it's still what they're doing is providing quality to people. And I know that there was a a movie that was just released a couple of weeks ago in the theaters, but because the theaters are shut down, they've decided to make it available on demand. It's amazing. Right? Remzo so, was talking about that. Uh, yeah. Blood, blood spot. Blood, blood spot. Is that blood, blood shot? shot. Yeah. Blood, yeah, shot. blood shot. That's it. Yeah. 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 And that's uh yeah, that's one that they're streaming. And so it's been a, uh, it's been cool to see people like, Hey, if your lives have adjusted to staying at home, uh, whether it's been fitness or singing or movies or video games or whatever it may be. Let's Disney like, released uh, Star Wars two days early on Disney <gasps> or on digital. Yay. Just want to throw that out there. <laughs> uh, yay. I do love that. Um, all right. So, so I think that takes care of a lot of what I was going to say. I mean, there's just been some cool like moments. Um, I'm a big sports fan. And while part of me wonders, some of the owners are being cool, but some of the, owners have done nothing and the players have sacrificed their own salaries to pay the arena workers and stuff that's canceled. Uh, Zion Williamson cost $500,000. I know here in Utah, we have Rudy Gobert and Donovan Mitchell, both of our like big superstars and they've donated money to help. Well, you, and, Mark Cuban was committing to take care of his, his people for the, you know, the whole time. So. 
Yeah, he's been one of those, like, I, I think everybody knows, like, he'll say something that's clearly unlibertarian, so you know he's not a libertarian, but, like, he says things where you just, like, you, we have some similarities with you, buddy. You got some lean there to you, and I think that's really cool that he's been, he's, um, you know, for being a famous businessman and, of course, being on part of the Shark Tank, you get used to saying no to people that even have good ideas but just aren't palatable that he's been good to, to donate, you know? Well, I think that what you find is that most people are libertarian-ish, they, they kind of lean that way or they think that way. But when push comes to shove and they see a problem and they want it fixed, they're trained to only think that government can fix that. Yeah. Right. So they don't understand, you know, some of the whys that's a bad idea. So it's like uh, with people on the right and the left, we're, there's so many times where we agree what the problem is. It's just what the solution is, is where we disagree. At. Yeah. So the diagnosis is, uh, and I guess that's a politician still have their use in the sense that they, sometimes are good at finding problems. It's just, uh, they have problems being the solutions themselves. And I guess that kind of highlights what I wanted to talk about today is people who are actually are providing solutions because Congress is debating a whole bunch of things. Some very, we never read anything about Venezuela or Nigeria or any of that. And we're just gonna print the <laughs> print money and, uh, and that'll hurt everybody. And then some says, well, let's hurt these people in order to benefit these people. And it's, you know, whenever the government's involved, I mean, at the very least, someone is getting hurt, even if it's just the taxpayer. And that's at best, you know, and then they choose who to help. And usually there's a lot of waste in between. And so for me, you know, a, year, a week ago, and I know I said this on the program already, but like, I just felt like this was going to be tough for libertarians. And I feel like kind of, almost everybody has been like, man, the market would have taken real good care of this and done a lot better than what our government did. And there's just been, it's not, obviously it hasn't been like a mass conversion for everybody, but it has been helpful. And I think it's good that we have libertarian leaders that they might not achieve the national recognition of like an elected representative, but are going forward and saying the bold and difficult things. And I mean, literally i mean even in ryan's case being willing to take a fine or go to jail potentially over saying no we're going to take care of these people and if good luck trying to stop us you know if you want to be the guy who stops us that really just proved my point all the more um that's kind of all i had to say man i just wanted to talk about some good news during this early times we'll look back of course and find more heroes i'm sure but you know we're, we're now that we're kind of either early or in the thick of things just wanted to wanted to find some people that are doing the right things i do want to ever give everybody a Sec with some last words. You can say whatever you want, anything that's on your mind. Just uh, take a couple minutes and we'll wrap up here. But uh, Ryan, why don't we start with you? Yeah, um, I guess I just want to real quick do a shout out to uh, all the people who are working at all the grocery stores and convenience stores and all, um, or any other, uh, the, you know, the restaurants that are still doing to-go orders, just all the people who, um, you know, are keeping keeping things going afloat right now. Um, I just feel like a lot of the times they're uh, super underappreciated in society and kind of looked down as like, oh, this is the job for like, you know, college dropouts or people with GEDs instead of high school diplomas. But uh, I think the past week or so, they've really proved how important they are. So I just want to shout out to them. And nobody complains about a high school dropout when they're cleaning your toilets and stocking your groceries and fixing your problems and, and changing your sink. Yeah, it's uh, for sure. Uh, Reinhold, why don't you go next? Uh, yeah, so I don't, I don't know if I really have much to add to all that. I mean, I, like, I have kind of been living in a quarantine type of state for the most part for the past several years. So, I mean, this is kind of not that new to me. But it is a little surreal to go. So this morning, I did go to the grocery store. because I do have to go every so often. Uh, and I went this morning as they opened. And just you could see the people who were working there were just tired. You know, they've been going through a lot and working hard. And I, I stop and talk to a couple just because, you know, social distance. I'm not going to be right up in their face or anything. But, yeah, I uh, always try to talk to them and make them feel a little bit better and, and let them know that we appreciate it. So. And they were telling me that it's actually as bad as what I saw this morning. It's it was worse days before. So they're feeling like it's starting to kind of letting up. But the store was like half stocked and there were people who were there right at open and they were trying to get in there and get the stuff and get out. And it's like, I just wish people would 
calm down a little bit on, on that sort of thing. There's going to be food. There's going to be stuff for you to take care of and to care, care of yourself. And we're going to get through this. And uh, but I just, I did appreciate the, the amount of work you could see that they had been doing in there. And uh, I went into a, a, a gas station to go to the bathroom and it was probably the cleanest I've ever seen a, a gas station bathroom. It smelled like antiseptic. It was so clean. Uh, and they're really doing a major job. I watched the guy because I was the only one in there and I was watching the guy who was working there I was putting vinegar in the machines because that's a new thing now. They run the vinegar through to make sure that everything gets clean. So if they give you food that it's uh, been disinfected through that way. So really? everybody's taking it seriously. Everybody's trying to do the best thing that they can do. And they're also, but they're still trying to provide a service that needs to be provided. So um, I'm just, I think, I think the people are going to get through this. It's the political stuff that's going to be, what's the fallout and, and who we point fingers at. And that's unfortunate, but that's just the way it's going to be because the way things were. So yeah. nature of government. You know. Yeah. Well, they told us not to freak out for a long time. So that's, they're going to get some fingers at them. But right now I think you're right. We need to Absolutely. focus on, yeah, let's, let's get through this and we can worry about kicking some butt later. You know, I think we let the market shine now and it, it just makes our point all the better. I think if we just blame them now, it just kind of goes to show like, where were you when we needed you? Whereas opposed to the uh, get out of our way and let us handle our business. Um, Andrew, go ahead and finish this up, buddy. All right. So I think um, as we continue to kind of get through this together, we're going to see a lot of um, people realize how disconnected they were before. And, and that, that book, uh, Them, that we were reading, uh, with Ben Sass, you know, he talked about how um, we've lost that community aspect and that community feeling. And I've really kind of seen on social media and Facebook, uh, people finding new ways to connect to one another. Um, you know, scrolling through Facebook a little bit earlier, you can see screenshots of people who have FaceTimed with six or seven of their friends or family members, and they're starting to do things a little bit differently. And I feel like, and I'm hoping that after this is all said and done, people have a better connection with their friends and family and neighbors. You know, this whole helping each other out in this time of need is great. And, and let's see um, it last past the, you know, pandemic of what's going on. And we continue um, to remind ourselves of, of this feeling of anxiety and stress, but then also remember how, you know, we can come together and help each other out and how, how that, actually helped make you feel better during this time of anxiety and stress. And we continue to, to live that way moving forward. So that's about all I have. Yeah, no, that's awesome. We can, the, the best place to start with Liberty is the people closest to you. You know, I think we, we try so hard to reach strangers on social media and Instagram because we, that's what we kind of see leaders, you know, the, the people we consider leaders doing when in reality, you know, your, your best, if you're a hero, it's hard to be a hero to somebody online. It's easy to be a hero to your own family. And I, I know there's a lot of uh, jokes one way or another that a lot of people are going to, the divorce rate's going to spike after this, getting stuck with your, uh, your spouse for a certain amount of time. Well, can be we, got a, we got a boomer, you know, we got a whole generation we call boomers because of the baby boom, because of the, you know, result of coming out of World War II. Are we going to see pandemic boomer you know type of thing so uh, well hopefully that's what they're doing instead of getting a divorce not to be crass but i mean, I mean that is, would be a little better <laughs> but this is really the promise that i always saw with the interconnectedness of the internet and then social media on top of that is that we can become more and the problem was we were becoming more separate for some reason for the political reasons we were becoming separate from each other uh putting up little walls little groups little sex that we were kind of fighting with each other and and getting into echo chambers and now i think we might be able to see the true um, promise of social media where people can start really connecting. Like I, I know my neighbor because I mean, I grew up always trying to know who your neighbors are, but I see a lot of people who don't, who who's never really cared or, or figured out who their neighbors were, but I know who my neighbors are. They help me. I help them as best I can whenever, whenever something comes up and uh, they're really awesome people. And I haven't seen them for a couple of weeks. Right. So uh, I can reach out to them on Facebook and say, Hey, are you need anything? Are you want anything? Uh, what's going on? What's, you know, can we, can we do to help? And um, I just think that that's really the benefit. I think hopefully we'll start seeing that become the forefront and the main purpose of social media instead of people just trying to tear everybody else down. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, and ho- like, yeah, hopefully, I guess it gains some more legitimacy as opposed to just, you know, a, a thing to do in our free time. It becomes an actual method of communication, which, like you said, I think that was the promise, right? That's That was the hope. So, yeah, that's good. Yeah, well, develop your, your relationships, guys. I think everybody had good points. Thank you, all three of you, for, for joining us. And thank you for tuning in, listener. We've, uh, we've been doing a lot of these and getting a lot of great feedback. And I think it, it's good to see more and more people tuning in. And I just hope that we could give some positivity today because there's, there's a lot of scary stuff that's happening that is legitimately scary that is something to focus on. And I'm not, I, di- I never want to come across somebody says, hey, don't worry, everything's going to be fine. But that doesn't mean good news goes out the window, you know, and, and when you see these types of things, we can't be so focused on Joker that we forget about Batman. You know, it, it's, it's, so, it's, it's a villainy has a place, but it needs to be put in its place. And if you don't believe that we are stronger then I think you're believing a little incorrectly. You know, anybody who's read Batman knows Batman, Joker might not never be dead, but he keeps routinely getting his butt kicked. And we're gonna, always going to have problems, but our Batman are stronger. You know, our hero, these heroes are stronger than these problems. And these problems are scary and they should be scary and they should be dealt with appropriately. But let's not forget that we're stronger. And you're stronger. You know, if you're listening to this and you're turning in, you're probably one of those people who care. And right now, nothing means more to your family than somebody who can give them good and honest advice, care about them, be safe with them, but also just be their relief. You know, if we're going to be trapped together, you know, let's, let's not think of it as a trap and think of it as an opportunity. I know for me, I've gotten closer with my gal and both her kids and I actually, uh, we got closed early, but I had Tuesday, Wednesday off anyway. So I've only been shut down for three days and I've already got closer to them. You know, if, if our finances would last forever, yeah, let's do this all year. You know, I'm kind of looking forward to it, but hopefully you feel the same way guys. Thanks again for tuning in and we will talk to you tomorrow.